Hi, this is Bob Castellino reporting for the Veil Daily on behalf of Climate Colorado. Today we'll be covering the history of Holy Cross, the difference of a cooperative utility versus an investor-owned utility, some of the challenges that Holy Cross faces reaching out to its constituents, both on a commercial and residential level. They serve 55,000 businesses and homes through Garfield, Pitkin County, as well as Eagle County here in the mountain west of Colorado. In addition, we'll be discussing technology changes and how Holy Cross is reaching out to its community to make a difference and how Holy Cross is challenged to further penetrate and reach out to people about the shift to renewable as well as distributed energy. Again, I'm Dale Worley, uh, CEO of uh, Holy Cross Energy. Great. How long have you been with Holy Cross and what's some of your background, Dale? I've been here since 1992 uh, at Holy Cross. Um, my degree is in applied mathematics from Colorado State University. Uh, I've spent uh, another 12 years at a generation transmission company prior to Holy Cross and then uh, about three years prior to that was in uh, IT for Bendex Field Engineering. Uh, spent a couple years in the Air Force. So that's kind of my career. Um, Holy Cross picked me up to manage their new power supply contracts because they would become a customer of XL, um, Public Service Company of Colorado. And so I started out managing those and then uh, slowly got the uh, responsibility of the billing department here and uh, consumer rep department. And as time went on, I got promoted up uh, to uh, further levels and then when the CEO left in uh, 2007, I applied for the job and got it. So you're running a cooperative energy utility which is different than um, an investor-owned utility. Can you explain the difference and how that affects the operations of Holy Cross? Well, a, a cooperative is actually owned by the consumers that, that we serve. They um, got started back uh, in the, uh, basically, the Depression, the Rural Electric Associations, and it was to rule uh, you know, electrify rural uh, America. They couldn't, the IOUs wouldn't serve the uh, rural uh, parts of the world because it, it couldn't make any money. So uh, government got together and uh, loaned money to people who were willing to start up these co-ops and this one started up 1939. Actually, it didn't get electricity out to people until I think 1941. Um, and it, it slowly grew into the uh, one we have today. And, and again, the members own the company and they elect a board of directors who in turn really are responsible for managing the company. So different than an IOU, stockholders are not necessarily customers. Uh, there is a divergence of interest who's better for the customer or the, the stockholder. Here the stockholder and the customer are the same. So if you believe to that philosophy, you can manage that to serve the same same person. And that's, what, that's the beauty of a co-op. And then it's a non-taxable entity, so you can actually save a little bit of money on on um, how to serve your customer from a cost standpoint. Because, again, because you're in the rural, the density is a lot less, and so it costs more in, in general to, to serve them, and so the fact that you can, uh, uh, you're, you're a non-taxable entity, you save some customers some money that way. You have a collaborative and contractual relationship with an IOU, which is Excel, and can you explain how that works? Well, again, coming out of the Ute bankruptcy, uh, we changed our power supplier from the bankrupt GNT um, and started buying all of our power from Excel. And so that arrangement happened. And along the way, and again, it's just a contractual arrangement with them. They, they supply all of our, our requirements. 
And then at one point, one of the um, contractual options we had was to buy into uh, some of their generation. So we bought uh, 60 megawatts of Comanche, uh, the new supercritical Comanche uh, coal plant in Pueblo. Uh, we can also uh, buy uh, on the open market if we choose to do that. We still have to pay XL capacity prices. But we get if we can beat their energy price, we can go out on the open market to do that. Then we had a little clause that uh, was called QF clause, and that clause allowed us to, as part of a QF qualifying facility under FERC rules, renewable energy is a definition. So if it's on our system in our territory, we can buy that and uh, under our contract, and, and XO didn't really have a choice. So that's allowed us to, to buy some renewable energy on, uh, that maybe other uh, entities don't have that flexibility in their contracts. Not just necessarily from a facility that generates the electricity, but um, uh, distributes the energy to homes and to businesses and government agencies. And that's where um, Holy Cross um, is, is operations uh, focused, is that correct? That's true. Yeah, they're, again, they're called a distributive uh, distribution cooperative, and that's usually what you'll find. It's just a distribution cooperative. They'll buy from either a uh, a GNT, which is a bigger cooperative that is owned by a whole bunch of distribution cooperatives. So, for example, Tri-State has 44 distribution co-ops that are served uh, serve their wholesale power uh, to each of those members. And they'll usually either take that power at the high side of the transmission on the distribution system or at the low side. And usually the transmission company, uh, GNT, will own the transmission. And so then the distribution co-op will go from the substation to the customer and own all of those poles and wires, besides the, you know, the headquarters building and those sorts of things. Explain how a GNT like Tri-State is different than Holy Cross, a distributive cooperative. Think about it, uh, a GNT, uh, uh, I'll give you Tri-State as the example, it has these 44 members out here um, working for it, or that, that are served the, both transmission and, and generation. They get that from the, the what's called the generation and transmission company. It too is a co-op, but their members are the distribution co-ops. So it's kind of like a co-op owning a co-op. Okay. Now, what happens is it's these members that own the GNT, but a lot of times, and this it's true, and I don't care if you quote me. Sometimes the GNT forgets who owns them. Hmm. It's because it then then if you go to each of the distribution co-ops, they have members, individual members, and businesses who own them. And everybody's got to remember who the dog is and who's the tail. Right. <laughs> and sometimes both co-ops and GNTs forget who the dog is. And the dog's the customer. Customer. How many people do you employ at Holy Cross? We've got about 160 employees, uh, 158 in, uh, in both valleys. Uh, probably half of them are operations people. The others department is engineering and then the consumer rep department which serves um, answers phone calls and does billing and, and those sorts of things and then you have to have your purchasing function uh, uh, you have energy efficiency department and member services uh, power supply materials uh, uh, so all of those departments make up sort of the other half of the operations. So, well, if you, if you, if you go back, I mean, uh, particularly this co-op, um, the board, if you go back many years, was farmers and ranchers. And then as, as time went on, it started to be more business people on here. Uh, time I came in in 92, there were people in real estate, there were people in business, there was a veterinarian, and some farmers and ranchers. Then it's transitioned um, into uh, more younger professionals. Uh, and more for, women. And more women. We have three women on our board. Uh, so 
that transition happened, uh, and some of that was driven by, again, I think our customer base, one, is very fluent, uh, although there is still a, a great deal of the uh, blue-collar service folks that, that we serve as well within these districts that are, you know, struggle with um, finding places to live. Uh, cost of living is very high here, but it's still driven by the resort industry. Uh, lots of money from where it used to be, farmers and ranchers, and you go way back, even quite a bit of mining still was here. Uh, coal mining was the last, probably, one to leave out of Carbondale. Uh, that was even before I, I came. So it, it, service territory has transitioned from you know really a rural atmosphere to a more cosmopolitan, and with that, also uh, it's our customers are very attuned to environmental issues, and we started uh, surveying I think back in the late '90s. And we've been surveying probably every three years, and we've asked critical questions to you. Do you Want to, are you willing to pay more to be green? Uh, do you, you want to pay more to get energy efficiency? Uh, then Amendment 37 come along, and all of those votes have been pretty pretty consistent in about two-thirds to 70 percent of our customer base. Um, it's really pro-green, pro-energy efficiency. And that drives, I mean, if, if, you, if you do what a co-op soldier should do, you listen to what your customers want. Um, a mix of energy that's for electrification about 50 to 60 percent from coal, um, 25 to 30 percent from gas, and then renewables about 20 percent. Is that correct? And does that, and how do you uh, uh, present that to your constituents as uh, matching their uh, requirements for green energy? Well, <clears throat> It's probably closer to 23 to 24 percent renewable. Um, I have to go back. I just got a graph on what they did the other day, but somebody will always, if there's a market for the coal, somebody will supply. That's for sure. Uh, you'll see more distributive generation. Uh, is it going to be the death spiral? I'm not sure I see that. Economies at scale win. Right. That's one of the first laws of economics, and I do not see house by house generation unless there's it's it's something that's being invented in a garage someplace. I don't see that taking over the world. Will there be a lot more off the grid people? Yeah, I do believe that. I think you will see ten or fifteen percent. But how are you going to do that in the huge cities? I mean, it just economies of scale will win, and particularly in the cities, in urban areas. So and, and, and for co-ops, I, I think I think yeah, I think you can see uh, a loss, a fairly significant loss of penetration over time in distributive generation. Do you have a contingency that carries forward, like a nonprofit organization, or do the profits you generate go into to the facility? How do, how does that work? Is that a question you're willing to? No, I mean it's, uh, to, it's, to, it's to the following, and so. That's another way that our members, they get that money back. We, those margins don't go anywhere. But you get to use it for things like capital projects uh, for a few years at no interest. Uh, it's really what's happening. So you get a little bit of time value of money. But at least they do get it back. Um, so that's how you fund the company along with your bankers. So I don't know if that makes sense. Makes complete sense. i got to make sure I'm recording. So. And I am. Thank you very much. So, I mean, that's another part of a co-op. It's a non-profit company. So you you take enough margins that you make all of your financial tiers with your bankers, and then you give that money back to them on some rotational basis. Some We're, we're more rapid than most. We're, uh, some will maybe give it back a 20-year rotation or a 25-year rotation. There may even be some out there that lot longer than that. Yeah. When, you, when you speak of rotation on a 15-year rotational basis, uh, can you explain Can you explain that a little bit further? Okay, so, so let's just say last year we made $7 million. That's not the right number, but it's close. So 
that seven million dollar margin gets allocated to the customers or that gave us that margin and, and, and that this year we'll just let's just go back to 2014 so we take that seven million we allocate that based on their usage out to all of the customers we keep track of that and so that gets put into an account then 15 years from now that amount of that seven million that they own or, or as allocated to them we'll give them back to them in cash but I've been so supported by Dale and the board and that you don't see that at all utilities and I wouldn't have lasted had I not had that support and that they listened to me and they let me have my passion and I believe in leading by example and so I will I insulated in air sealed my townhouse and I put in LEDs I mean I really try to set the example because I think it starts with me. And I'm the Energy Efficiency Program Administrator with Holy Cross and I've been here since September of 2012. And prior to that, I worked actually for the Boulder County Energy Smart Program. So Boulder County and the city and county of Denver won a $25 million stimulus grant. And so I was working with commercial businesses to get them to be more energy efficient using that grant money and then local money also. And prior to that, I worked for Specialty Sports Venture as their first eco manager, so environmental and community outreach manager. And they were a big retailer owning over 150 stores, kind of in Western um, United States. So we definitely started addressing lighting because in retail that can be up to 40% of your electric bill. So that's a little bit of my background. I have a BA in environmental studies, so I'm very passionate, as I think everybody here knows, very passionate about um, about the environment and, and how humans are impacting it and how I personally can find a career that will help educate people on how they can lessen the impact. And so when this job became available, it was a great fit because everybody thinks, especially co-ops, that utilities are very conservative, very coal-based, and how we can turn that around. And really, if our members use 10%, 20% less energy, that's 20% less coal we're burning. So I think energy efficiency is, is really vital to, to the climate change. And that's what's really confusing in the valleys because there's Energy Smart Colorado, which started because of the government you know the government our money stimulus money so they're with kind of the energy smart umbrella because they both kind of help do that program to help us with at least on the small to medium sized commercial businesses and then we also work with them on the residential side too we all have the same common goal we all want to help holy cross members reduce their energy load and reduce their bill so we all have that common goal and so that's where we have that partnership with them. Sure, and right. can you explain um, your relationship with Colorado Energy Smart, people like Walking Mountains Core and right. Clear, right. and so that people understand what um, Colorado Energy Smart is? Yeah. yeah, so they're another entity that is now staying alive through um, the, the local counties are now supporting them because we know the stimulus money is already gone and it had to be spent by a certain deadline and that was a couple years ago. So now they've gone out and gotten you know local companies to support them and the county commissioners. So um, getting money locally or from the Eco Build in Eagle County or REMP, which are if um, people build over 5,000 square foot homes, they have to offset because they're considered energy high energy users. They have to offset their energy use by either renewable energy or pay pay this eco builder ramp it's called in Pitkin County fee so they're using some of that money to off, also offer rebates so members that are in Holy Cross territory can apply for Holy Cross rebates and Energy Smart Colorado rebates so um, we work collaboratively on that and tell our members about both rebates and help members collect as much rebate as they can we also collaborate and limit the rebates to 50 percent of the project cost so that you know there's um, Holy Cross Energy Smart have some some skin in the game and so does our, our member that it's not we're not going to pay a hundred percent because we feel that they need to be behind this energy efficiency upgrades or renewable energy whatever they want to do so that's how we've partnered with Energy Smart Colorado to help us do that I mean I'll go door to door and talk to retailers and stuff like that but there's still more work to be done to get the word out about our rebates and why you would want to go to LEDs or 
you know, VFDs. There's so many opportunities that out there that we're just we're just scratching the surface right now. Moving to LED and the investment and um, making that possible, so they understand that this return on investment is something that they're uh, going to be saving on. Mm -hmm. It's going to improve the quality of their life. Right. Explain some of the challenges you face with that and um, bringing it to the public's attention. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great that's a great question, and definitely LEDs, the solid state lighting is is probably one of the biggest technology advances that we've made in the last 130 years. When you look at Thomas Edison created that light bulb 130 years ago, and where 90 95 percent of that light bulb is wasted heat where the LED technology is much more efficient, it lasts you know, 10 times as long as an incandescent. And for many people, they say the LED will outlive them, you know, especially in a residential thing. People are starting to understand the LED. The great thing is the technology is coming, getting better and the cost is coming down because of supply and demand. Simple economics, like you said. So. It's getting to be an easier sell. We show what the payback would be. So if people are thinking the long run, like if you're thinking a six month payback, it's not gonna be there. But in a two year, the payback is gonna be there. And it's just gonna make sense that you have a better quality light, you're gonna cool your your area, and you're gonna have, you know, people aren't gonna have the headaches. You know, a lot of people get migraines and headaches from fluorescent lightings where LEDs don't, don't do that. And so they just, everybody's starting to grasp that it is. And I think as the price comes down with LEDs, it's gonna be easier and easier to sell and sell it. It's gonna be demand driven and right. consumer, right. consumers driving demand right. based on, oh my God, I, not only can I change, but right. the more we buy these things, the, the price will drop. Right, right. And it's all about LED now. Like there's um, an annual light fair that goes on and and now they should just call it the LED light fair because it is all about LEDs and now the next next thing is going to be all about controls like why are lights on when you have a lot of great daylighting or a lot of we see a lot of parking garages that are on 24 7 so but nobody's been in that parking garage for hours so why not put those lights on controls and so I think that's going to be the next step is starting we have the LED lights, now let's get them on controls, and they are. There's some just great products out there now. So explain what you folks do that's different than other cooperatives. Mm -hmm. So for the since last year, we've offered an on, it's called on-bill financing. And what that means, it's low interest loans um, offered through Bank of Colorado. So we've partnered with a local banking institution here to um, pay off that loan for that energy efficiency upgrade through the Holy Cross bill. So for example, if you heat with electricity, so our all electric homes are definitely people that we are targeting for insulation, air sealing, and windows. So if you have 25 year old leaky windows, and we know that's a huge investment, 10, 20, $30,000 in some of these homes, that you can get the loan with Bank of Colorado as long as you're in good standing and have good credit rating. Um, and then you pay off the loan through your Holy Cross bill. And in theory, your your electric bill should be a little lower with this energy efficiency upgrade so the financial burden isn't so hard to pay off that loan. And so we collect it every month as part of your Holy Cross bill. Uh, interest rates for a one or two year loan are low, as low as 2.95%. So very, very affordable um, interest rates right now. A super value, actually. A super value, especially with windows and, and on the residential side, those seem to be a big ticket item. Again, we only do them with electric heated homes because those are because we're an electric only co-op, so we're interested in kilowatt hour savings. On the commercial side, it's interesting. A lot of the mom and pops, the small commercial businesses I mentioned on bill financing, the low interest loans, and they just don't want to take on any debt or more debt. And so that's kind of the barriers. Um, Gas furnaces, boilers, those are other big ticket items for people. And because, again, we're electric only, we don't um, offer loans for, for those items. So we haven't had a big uptick on it, but we're trying to make some inroads there and letting people wear it. Can you explain about the Think Big and the We Care programs mm -hmm. that Holy Cross offers 
constituents. Mm -hmm. So I think that the We Care started in 2004, I want to say. And that, again, was based on survey from our members saying, how much are you willing to give on your monthly bill toward energy efficiency and renewable energy rebates? And the kind of answer was about 2%. So we collect 2% on every member's bill every month to pay for the energy efficiency and renewable energy rebates. And so that's why we're trying to tell people you're paying into the program, let us help you, you know, lower your bill. So we offer complimentary um, home assessments where we'll come in with the infrared camera, look at where your house is leaking, um, give you a couple of LEDs to try and wrap your water heater if it's electric. When, when you say complimentary, that means free, free right? Free, right. Right, so it's a great way to learn some energy efficiency tips. Uh, get a couple of LEDs if you haven't already tried them. If people are a little scared of new technology, right? Changing, and you'd be surprised at how how comparable the LEDs are now to the incandescent. And then wrap water heaters. You don't realize how much heat is being lost, and especially some of these older water heaters. But it's just a great way to kind of get a baseline in your house, and then look at um, what rebates we offer and how you can upgrade your house. So that's what the We Care program is for. It supports staff and it supports um, us going out there and giving out the rebates. The Think Big Grant was another idea that came out from the Energy Efficiency Department to um, get literally get our big businesses to think big. Like I, our goal is to, after five years, to reduce our our consumption by two and a half percent. So that's about 33,000 megawatt hours, which is a pretty big number. And so the Think Big Grant was looking for people that could save at least 500,000 kilowatt hours a year. So Town of Vail is one example who won the grant and they went out and uh, decided to change most of their light bulbs in their street lights, in all their municipal buildings, parking garages, everything from whatever they were, incandescent, fluorescent, to LED lighting. So in the end, they'll save about 18% on their on their total electric bill. So that's kind of where we're kind of going with the energy efficiency program, trying to get people to think beyond lighting, think, you know, there's motors and VFDs and refrigeration and just so much electrical use out there at that. Sounds like a, a great program. But how many people do you have on staff just helping you, or are you just one individual running around <laughs> to these 10,000 businesses, counties, cities, and uh, 45,000 residential combustor? You must split yourself off at night and run like crazy. Yeah, we don't clone people here, but we do have a, a fairly small staff. So there's myself that's 100% doing the administration of the program. So I come up with the rebate ideas and administer it. And then we have Eileen, who's our home auditor that goes out and do the home audits. Uh, Lisa helps me process rebates, kind of the in office stuff to help me process rebates and, and answer the phone and stuff like that. And then of course there's Chris, who is our supervisor. So we're kind of really only two full times and then a couple of half time FTEs. And then that's why we've partnered with Energy Smart Colorado um, to help us with the small to medium sized businesses to go out and do some outreach and help with rebate applications because I think that's kind of a barrier. People want the rebate, but when you have to like fill out the rebate application, people don't want to take the time to do that or contractors don't want to do that. So we'll help them and Energy Smart uh, Colorado will help them with the rebate application. We just need to know about the projects and stuff. So great. And then I go out and do the commercial audit. So I'll come into a commercial business and go in and help audit just a walkthrough giving you some ideas. I mean I'll look at electricity and then I'll even give you some ideas on how to save on the gas side too because it's a holistic look at, at a building. Great. Wow. Sounds like you guys are doing more than uh, people understand and know. And right. It sounds like you're really concerned to get to all the doors and reaching out and maybe there isn't enough time in the day and enough people to get that done. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? It is a challenge. I think in my interview when I took this position, I talked about wanting to touch every 55,000 or 48,000 members. That's kind of a daunting task. So I think that's what we're really doing this year is getting out more to like farmers markets, the Ego Home Show. I mean, I try to get out of the office one or twice a week. 
Um, even just going door to door to talk to people, you know, doing some inspections of lighting, um, building relationships with our key account. People are big users. Obviously, the ski industry is huge because we do Skiko, we do Vail Resorts. Uh, building the relationship. Tell me a little bit about um, things that you can improve operationally uh, to um, uh, improve uh, what you deliver to your customers just by working in your own uh, operations to improve efficiency and what you're trying to accomplish here in your administration and uh, throughout your whole operation. Yeah, you know, we added a lot of uh, facilities over the last few years and as we went through and, and you know, did some reconstruction, we changed out a lot of our old uh, inefficient uh, heating systems and, and put in far more efficient uh, uh, systems in our, both our warehouses and then when we built this addition to this building, uh, we actually did it to lead specs, even though we didn't get the, the program. And uh, as you see, blinds that go up and down, lighting changes, uh, more automated heating in this building. Um, so, uh, you know, working on the lights as we slowly go through this, uh, the more we can be efficient in our own facilities, uh, our customers uh, are better off indirectly. You bet. I'm going to switch gears a little bit into uh, the broader perspective of the economy, the, the climate, the perspective of global climate change and technology, and ask you a few questions as an energy provider. Um, and I asked this question of you in Paonia, so I'm going to go right back to it. We know that uh, there's a giga plant being pr uh, built by Tesla producing um, battery storage energy, and we know that battery storage is out there already. already. Um, how do you see um, a technology driver like Tesla affecting a cooperative like um, uh, Holy Cross and how does that affect your business modeling and your planning process with your team and um, working with the com community as um, those market forces affect you? Well, as I think I talked a little earlier, well, uh, I don't see the giant death spiral uh, effect of uh, losing all of your customers to distributed generation. But clearly the more rural uh, co-op you are, and we're actually a fairly dense uh, co-op as co-ops go, uh, we've got about 18 customers per mile, we're, a lot of them are three and four customers per mile. I think this whole Tesla battery thing, for them there will be a threat of off-grid because you will be able to go get you a solar panels and a few days storage and you'll, you'll be able to go off the grid or even if you don't go off the grid you won't use much electricity. Um, the other place that's really going to play a bigger role as time goes on is, is balancing renewable generation wherever it's at. Um, again, intermittent solar and, and wind Battery storage is going to be the key, any kind of storage, whether it's battery storage or pump storage or whatever other kind of storage comes up, it's going to be the real key to making them become a bigger role in, in our energy mix. Uh, right now, natural gas, which is fossil fuel, does the load following for those, for those particular assets. Now, as you look out into the future and you t want to get more and more carbon free, you have to have more storage uh, for those renewable intermittent products to, to follow load. and So they'll play a key role. How much is, what, what is the long-term pricing uh, and, and the constraints on the system and whether nuclear fusion ever comes along or who knows what technology will be invented in somebody's garage. Uh, solutions, it's a little hard to tell, but storage is a, is a a player. It has to be. With the prices of uh, uh, solar panels dropping so significantly because of the glut of panels being thrown into the market by China and production and demand increasing um, and uh, it affecting uh, folks making the choice to it, does that affect how you look at um, incentives relative to Excel's model and um, uh, uh, 
supporting uh, the move to uh, distributed um, renewable energy sources at home and in businesses? Well, we've been probably ahead of the curve. We've probably had net metering customers before anybody else in the state. Uh, Amory Lovins of the Rocky Mountain Institute was our first net metered customer late 80s, I believe. And then we had um, the uh, Chalet, I think it is, who net metered a, uh, a uh, hydroelectric on their uh, on the local watering system, and they net metered for years as well. And then uh, people like Randy Udall and stuff, we started letting them net meter about 1998. So we've been in the forefront of net metering probably in Colorado. Uh, we may have in fact been the first, I don't, it's hard to say, but certainly close. And we, we have a fairly robust uh, net metering plan. We've still probably got the highest rebates uh, around as far as upfront initial rebates and and now we're also rebating people who are getting into the community solar under clean energy collective um, I don't know if that answers your question this is good 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 answers anybody can get um, there's two big river systems draining into the Colorado River <laughs> that join here from the Roaring Fork and the Eagle um, and the Colorado that drains down out of Rocky Mountain um, with so much energy running through these valleys just in water. Um, is it possible that Holy Cross could uh, find its way into hydroelectric power on as a part of your energy mix? Well, we already have done some of that. We helped the town of Basalt uh, with a hydro program on their water system. Um, with Aspen Ski Company, we've got a, a hydro on their uh, snowmaking system. Um, Got several net metered hydro uh, on our system. We've put the pl in place a standard offer tariff, hoping somebody will come and take advantage of that. Unfortunately, and this is something I've not understood, uh, legislatures or somebody needs to figure out borrowing the water for a, a little bit out of these ditches shouldn't need all these fancy water rights. All you're doing is borrowing it for a little bit, putting it back in the whatever waterway it was, maybe a little warmer, but, <laughs> and so you gotta have water rights for it, and then you've got all of these rules that you gotta follow. Uh, hydroelectric should be easier than it is. And I know there's been a lot of legislation that's trying to make it easier, but I don't, I, it's something I don't understand that you have to have the water rights if you can just, do, you know, detour it a little bit, stick it back in where it belongs. Why do you need a water right for that? Yeah, and isn't there a, a significant diversion right here on the Colorado, just outside of the town of Glenwood? Well, there's the old Shoshone power plant, and again, that's borrowing it out of the river for about two miles in a place that really doesn't hurt anything. And um, what does it drop it like a uh, hundred feet, two hundred feet, in order to generate a it's not very much, it's not very much, right? I mean, we, we, we'd love to get more hydro on. We, we've done everything we can other than maybe we need to go out and try to develop it ourselves. But again, then you fight. And then pretty soon, you know, no different than the city of Aspen, they tried to put in a one megawatt and the big dollars fought it and finally killed it. You're really an advocate for generating from the most efficient sources, wherever it is, to provide your customers the lowest rate. Is that true? There's, you know, I mean, we obviously take cost into, into place because there is a cost threshold even with our customer uh, as affluent as they are. Uh, they said that they're willing to pay 4 or 5 percent more. Um, and so we keep that in mind, but we certainly, are, any technology, I mean, we've d jumped into cold vented methane, which is one of the first, if not the first one that's been put to the grid in the United States. Uh, clearly in Colorado, this is, we've got the biggest uh, woody biomass plant in Colorado uh, that's grid connected. So we're not, it can't be, it's not necessarily just wind or solar, it's anything that's somewhat cleaner. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll give it a shot if it makes sense. In finishing up today, what would you like to tell the people of the Roaring Fork Valley and Eagle and Glenwood Springs 
about Holy Cross that you think they should understand about you that um, is going to make a difference for the future? Just remember, we, we're working for them. They're, they're our customers and we're working for them. So if you have an issue, let us know what it is. I, I const constantly run into people that are in another utilities territory and ask, when is Holy Cross going to bring their lines over here? And it's like, and I say, you have to move into Holy Cross territory. So that says a lot about Holy Cross, where people wish they were in our territory, but they just purchased in another utilities territory. And that says a lot about what Dell, as a leader for this company, is doing, in that all 158 employees really, truly do put the member first. It's an amazing team of people to work here.